This is Bewilderbeasts, an infotainment show dedicated to inspiring curiosity for all ages by investigating the ways animals intersect at humanity. I am not a historian, an ethologist, a researcher, a scientist, a zoologist, a trained audio engineer, or an expert in, well, anything. Y'all, I'm lucky if I can remember to put my clean laundry in the dryer before it gets funky. And while I make every effort to present things as accurately as I can with a fun flair, I'm going to mess up. And that's okay. I hope I've given you a nice place to jump off from on your own adventures into curiosity. Or at the very least, I've given you the key to win your next round of trivia. And welcome to Bewilderbeasts. I'm your host, Melissa McKee McGrath, recording in the basement, which I'm now calling the dungeon. Today, we're talking about a whole lot of royalty who made a whole lot of bad decisions. You ready? Let's go. Y'all, next week is my 50th episode. Woo woo! And it's going to be a good one. I have been saving this story for a really big milestone, and I'm very excited. I'm not going to spoil it, but it's lit. And that's a huge hint. But for today, I just wanted to do something a bit more silly as it's been a minute. So let's get into another series of old-timey royalty being rather unfortunate in some manner or another. Philip, you didn't really have a chance. King Philip doesn't get a number in succession, like King Philip II or 3rd or 1,000th, because he never, ever, ever, ever got to lead the country by himself. Much like a driver's permit in the United States allows you to drive a vehicle with a licensed driver, King Philip co-ruled France with his father, King Louis VI, in the passenger seat with a plug-in brake at his feet just in case Philip decided to drive recklessly, which he did. Unfortunately, Philip's dad had a nickname. I mean, you're not really a king until you have your birth name, your king name, your coronation name, your succession name, and your unfortunate nickname. King Louis VI was and is now known the world over as Louis the Fat, which unfortunate nickname. And what's even more perplexing is that Louis the Fat was depicted in quite a thin manner on his seal. I can't tell if that's the 1100s version of an Instagram filter You just make yourself look a lot skinnier on the seal than you would appear in real life. He goes on like pigeon post king tinder and he doesn't look like his photo. But anyway, King Philip never got a number or a nickname. Instead, when he was 15 years old, he went out horseback riding without a helmet. Always wear a helmet when on a horse, kids. And it's said that a little pig ran out from behind a dung heap. Okay, I'm going to stop right here and say several things. How little was the pig, and how big was this pile of poop? Ew. You couldn't find another place to ride your pony? You are the king of France. Co-king of France. Okay, assistant to the regional manager version of the king of France. Really? You are in the French countryside. Why are you riding a horse by literal poop? <laughs> and, and, and at that, poop high enough to hide a whole pig. Things are about to get way worse for the teenager King Philip. His horse tripped. We've talked about this happening several times on the show. Crashed into the ground. Philip hit his head and he never woke up. This pig went on to basically change the course of France's history. With Philip not reaching the throne, his brother Louis VII took France's reins and directly caused the deaths of thousands of people in terrible ways by leading the Second Crusade. Usually, kids, when you hear the word crusade, that's a bad thing for a lot of people who are not European. Historically, crusades were a series of attempts by white men leading medieval military expeditions made by Europeans to steal the Holy Land from the Muslims in the 11th, the 12th, and the 13th centuries. Hey, you know that this thing didn't work a hundred years ago. Let's try it again. And again. 
So King Philip died before his dad did, never got to drive the kingdom solo, never got a number, so he's not even considered in the French succession of kings, while his brother murdered a whole bunch of people and also got a ton of his own people killed too. In the immortal words of the 1990s R&B band TLC, don't go chasing pigs and poop, just stick to the rivers and the lakes like you're used to. When you are lucky enough to be the king, and it's the 900s, and other people are actually running the country and you're just kind of king in name only, you really only have one job. And that job is to make babies. King Louis V also had a rather unfortunate nickname, King Do Nothing, or as I'm saying, Lazy Louis. He was too lazy to wear a riding helmet and he died as apparently everybody in the first half of this uh, whole episode is going to do by falling off a horse. But his fall happened without an heir. And it appears that he was only king for about a year before he died himself. But do nothing did nothing. Which might be why his wife tricked the fifth Louis. And while he was out, she packed up and peaced out and married someone else before his death. Harold Fairhair or Harold the Lousy. Not lousy, lousy. As in lice. Bathing, not really a thing in the late 800s to early 900s. It said that King Harold decided not to cut his hair until he became king. I sometimes grow mine out to donate to Locks for Love, but this sounds like a really weird flex. I'm not cutting my hair until you make me king. Is that supposed to help things or something? Anyway, with long locks and no bathing, lice was most assuredly a thing. Itchy, itchy, itchy. Okay, now little princes and princesses, don't share brushes or crowns lest you get lice. They didn't have nicks back then, so you just have to live with the thousands of lice homies on your head. No wonder so many people went mad back then. I thought it was mostly the inbreeding and lack of adequate mental health support, but maybe this was just part of why so many kings and queens went a little off the rails. More on that next week. But Harold didn't die in an unfortunate way. Just, he had a terrible nickname. It turns out when he hit 80 years of age, it was policy not to allow a king or ruler to make financial decisions anymore, or decisions about how inheritance works. These are called Grey Goose Laws. So Harold co-ruled with his son, Eirik, and he died at 83 years old. Nothing unsettling. I mean, except for all the lice. I mean, there are worse nicknames for kings and royalty. We have John the Baby Maker, and I guess his opposite, Henry the Impotent, who was forced to marry his cousin Blanche, which might be why he never consummated that relationship. Local sex workers, however, said he was, quote, just fine in the not impotent department. We also have Bermudo the Gouty, Constantine the Dung Named, which was maybe old timey for doo doo head, but really rather vague. However, James II was just straight up called James the <laughs> because the Irish were not having it. Apparently, James pulled a trump by inheriting a prosperous and financially secure England when he got the crown. Then he immediately. all over it. And when that wasn't enough, he took England's great seal and he just tossed it nonchalantly into the river. He beat feet to Ireland, made some friends there, and then promptly abandoned them too. So we can thank the Irish for dubbing him Seamus Ancaca, which we've already been over what that translates to. We also have Einstein the Fart, Ferdinand the Bomb, which I don't think is the bomb is in 90s for Superfly, but instead bombed a town of civilians under the erroneous belief that it was a hideout for separatists. We have Ivalu the Cabbage, Louis the Unavoidable, and it's said that after Napoleon died, he was the unavoidable choice to come and take the throne. That just seems so meh. It hurts. Meh. We have... Manuel the Sausage Maker, which you are free to go down that rabbit hole if you like. We have Piero the Unfortunate, who died drowning trying to escape battle. And William the Bastard. These are all names that live on an infinity, and I really wanted to use some of these good ones, but there were 
are just no animal connections, so we're just stuck with Robert the Little Beagle. Going back to likely inbreeding, Robert Cecil was short, even for the time, at five foot four, and he had a hunchback, which prompted King James I of England to nickname him My Little Beagle, which is insulting to beagles and people like me standing at five foot four. Hi, I'm like right here. It's also insulting to Robert, and for my UK listeners, he was the main discoverer of the gunpowder plot, which led to Guy Fawkes' arrest on November 5th, 1605. Remember, remember the 5th of November? That rhyme is about the gunpowder plot, where enough incendiary was placed under the House of Lords to blow it to smithereens on opening night of Parliament. With the main target being King James himself. Never ever count out a beagle. The men who led the plot were either engulfed in flames while fleeing because fire and gunpowder equals bad, or hanged, drawn and quartered, and tortured across the street from the very building that they intended to blow up. The Beagle lived for quite some time, rising the ranks to Lord Privy Seal, which I don't think means toilet in this case. and eventually became High Lord Treasurer before his death in 1612. Huge old-timey disclaimer on this one, as it was around 200 AD, and I'm fairly confident they didn't have Snopes back then, so take everything here with a grain of salt. Make that an entire salt lick. Ready? We have Lugade, known as Mac Con. That literally translates to son of a hound, or in this case, son of a bitch, as it said that he was raised on the milk of his, I'm guessing, terrible stepdad, Ileal Nude Ear, hound, anyway, Nude Ear, who, who is said to have killed his own stepson years later by biting him in the face. Yeesh! I bet their Thanksgivings were super awkward. Anyway, we can't leave the Vikings out. Here is one name that should be in a Thor movie, Ragnar Lothbrok. Again, old-timey disclaimer, but new-timey nickname. Lothbrok, or Lothbrok, translates either to hairy pants, hairy breeches, which might be how he was introduced to royalty. It's a little classier than hairy pants. Or my personal favorite translation, Ragnar Shaggy Breeches, which, because it turns out he was quite the stud. Sure, he was the chieftain and everyone who was everyone wanted a piece of those hairy pants, but it is said that he, the chieftain, went full assault on both a bear and a wolf to win his first wife's favor. And it worked. Man, if only do-nothing Louis V here had taken a page out of this book, he may have had a better story, right? And maybe some kids? A wife? Well, now that I'm thinking about it, maybe Louis V was the first inspiration for what later became American country music. My wife left, I have no kids, I died a year after my dad gave me France. The name apparently stemmed from, and again, this is maybe right, maybe not, but maybe, he wore cowhide pants intended to protect him from a sassy snake that he had to destroy. More on the word irony in a minute. Anyway, there seems to be some kind of consensus here. Again, way back then records were iffy at best, but it seems that Sir Shaggy Pants was responsible for leading the Vikings into Paris, insultingly said to the French, Oh, ha, ha, nice country, it would be a shame if somehow someone were to just take it. Oh, wait, we just did. And then after the Parisians peaced out, the Vikings got pretty drunk on whatever was around. I'm sure probably champagne, cognac, both were involved. And then turned around and sold France back to Charles the Bald of France, which I guess happened a lot. Vikings would come in, sack a city, have a great big party, and then have Charles just buy it back from them, ransom style, with the promise of their retreat. Sure, pay us 7,000 pounds of gold and silver and we'll leave. But we didn't say we wouldn't come back. And they did. They came back and back and back. Ah, poor Charles the Bald. Anyway, Ragnar Harry Bridges eventually shipwrecked in England in 865. King Ela took a look at the Viking and just chucked him into a snake pit. So his pants, hairy or not, were not invincible to snake venom. 
However, remember, Viking! The revenge of the hairy pants is best served cold. All of Ragnar's sons got together, raised a massive army led by... My god, these names are awesome. Ivar the Boneless and handled King Ila. Side note on Ivar Banlausi, the real name of Ragnar's son. It could translate to Ivar the Boneless, but it could also translate to Legless. Hey, Legolas, Lord of the Rings, hmm? As the word for leg and bone were the same word at the time. Those were the best possible translations. There were other options as Ivar the Boneless is really maybe Ivar the Impotent? There are zero good translations of this poor guy's name. His brothers all had interesting names too. Bjorn Ironside, not bad. Half Dan Ragnarsson, which back in the day, you I guess you just couldn't go full Dan. Hivetskirk? Hivetskirk. Vitzirk. I have no idea. I'm really trying. Uba, and my personal favorite, Sigurd Snake in the Eye, which, given his dad died in a snake pit, either they had the weirdest foresight or a very macabre sense of humor that truly we should all bow down to. And while this guy wasn't royalty... He went by the name Snake King, and he royally messed up. Ali Khan Samsudin of Malaysia was a legendary snake aficionado. Apparently, he cohabitated with over 400 cobras. Don't do that. And he was bitten 99 times during his lifetime by snakes. Apparently, he had 99 problems, and snake bites were literally all of them. It's the 100th one that will get you which is exactly what happened to the Snake King. A different king, a king cobra, bit Ali Khan Samsudin, and his health, as you can imagine, after being bitten by a cobra, started to take a turn. Weirdly, the family waited two days before, and this is a quote, rushing him to the hospital. After two days, it's really not rushing, is it? And he died before he could be treated. There are several lessons in here. When you are the king of any animal, that animal will likely be your downfall, whether it's a snake, a bear, or a tiger. And if you are bitten by a wild animal that you think that you can outsmart, maybe don't be a hero and seek medical attention stat. There was one other guy I was going to leave out, and he had no connection at all to royalty, but he did think that he was appointed by God, which ultimately his hubris was his downfall. George Went Hensley of the great state of Tennessee was a Pentecostal minister who believed, and I'm going to go out on a limb here and say wrongly believed, that the New Testament of the Bible directed all Christians to handle venomous snakes. You can see where this is going, can't you? Apparently, his ministry was heavy on the snake handling and less focused on family or not breaking the law. He had been arrested for moonshine-related incidents, escaping from a workhouse and fleeing the state, I'm unclear on the Bible's stance on the lamb. He was documented in divorce papers as having issues with drunkenness, which might explain the snake thing. Yeah, I can handle a snake. Watch this. Frequent traveling, so I'm going to go on a limb here and say he has way more than 13 kids. Because he was on the lamb, this pastor established churches, and my favorite was called Church of God with signs following. What signs? Anyway, he was arrested for at least two more incidences of whipping his snakes out in public as snake handling venomous snakes was illegal. He said he was bitten more than 400 times by snakes, which accounting for all of the above might be as few as three and as many as a bazillion. There's no way to know, but we do know he was bitten at least once, as this was the one that mattered. In 1955, he was conducting a service in where else but Florida and was bitten by a snake, unsurprisingly to those listening and probably very surprisingly to those watching as they were told and believed that snake handling was what good Christians do so they wouldn't ever get hurt. He became incredibly sick as the venom coursed through his veins. Like so many 
hey, watch thisers out there. He refused to seek medical attention, and you'll never believe this. He died the following day. So thank you for joining me today on this series of historical dies on Bewilderbeasts. Come back again next week for number 50. Maybe we should have a party. I'll bring cake. Don't forget to check out the Patreon, patreon.com slash bewilderbeastpod. Bonus episodes for everyone at a dollar a month and extra goodies for those who support at a higher level. I just sent out these cute little extra bonuses to patrons at the $5 and above level, so... If you like to get spontaneous mail, I happen to like to send spontaneous mail. Or if you have a kiddo who would like a personalized note, just send me a line and I can just make that happen. If you want to hear the OG piece on the many, many, many kings who died by animals, check out episode 28, The Flying Turtle Who Killed a Guy. I really love that episode and I'm so glad I got to do another version of that today. Lots of history, people who wrongfully believed wild animals should be pets, and royalty who didn't believe in helmets, which changed global politics dozens of times over. Oh, hey, and if there are topics that you'd be interested in hearing about on the podcast, know of any historical animals who changed the world, animals who help humans, or people who died centuries ago who serve as cautionary tales, wear a helmet. Send them in to bewilderbeastpod at gmail.com. Tweet at Bewildered Pod. I'm very active on Twitter. Bewilder Beast Pod on Facebook and Bewilder Beast on Instagram. I'm Melissa McHugh McGrath with Mutt Stuff Media. Now go get curious. I got today's information from wikipedia.org. All that's interesting, Britannica.com, the seven monarchs with unfortunate nicknames, unofficialroyalty.com, royal deaths from horse accidents, wikipedia.org on George Went Hensley, Mental Floss, thank you, Mental Floss for everything. An article called A List of Louis by NewOrleansBar.org, Ranker.com, list of famous people who died of animal attacks, and the BBC. Links, as always, are in the description of today's episode. Intro music is Tiptoe Out the Back by Dan Leibowitz, and interstitial music is by MK2. Additional music is provided by Pixabay and Freesound.org. Don't forget to like, subscribe, review, and the best thing you can do is share an episode with your curious friends. Thank you so much for listening. I will see you next week. Happy Halloween! <laughs>